Good morning, church. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here today on the second day of Labor Day weekend, September 1st. Tomorrow being Labor Day. And uh, just thank you. Thank you for making the time and making it a priority coming to uh, church this morning. A few more here this, this, this service than uh, first service. They must have been all sleeping in. But uh, this, this is a really good crowd for uh, Labor Day weekend. I appreciate that. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Uh, but before I do, let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you in this house of yours. Thank you for this church, this church body, and those that may be watching online. Bless each and every one of them, I ask. I also ask that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we would be receptive to your word, and may your Holy Spirit give me the words to speak with encouragement, with boldness, and with truth. I ask this in your son's name, amen. Some of you know that I, I grew up in Phillipsburg, not too, too far from here. And uh, I always looked at Labor Day weekend as the end of summer and the start of school. For that reason, I hated Labor Day weekend. You can guess my favorite holiday was Memorial weekend, end of school, beginning of summer, and now I find myself a school teacher. How's that work? But uh, I think sometimes God has a sense of humor because you, you would have asked me when I was a senior in high school if I would have been a school teacher. Um, <laughs> that was the furthest thing fr probably from my mind. But a little background for today's sermon. Um, Labor Day weekend is really an opportunity for us to celebrate the economic achievements and social achievements of laborers, of workers in this society. I told First Service, it started, the, the labor movement really started in the late 1800s when the average worker in America would work uh, 12 hours a day, oftentimes seven days a week, just trying to make a, a very modest living. Even though states had laws that tried to regulate child labor, there were many kids five, six years of age that were working in uh, very dangerous conditions, in, in factories, in mills. Um, with that as a backdrop, things kind of came to head. In Chicago in 1894, uh, there was the notorious, um, what they call the Pullman strike. And Pullman was a, a major manufacturer of trains, well, train cars, cargo, passenger cars. And um, federal forces came in, troops came in. In Chicago alone, there was like 30 or 40 were killed. It spread from Chicago and it was nationwide. And things finally simmered down and one of the ways Washington tried to kind of calm the temperature, lower the temperature a little bit in our society was with the congressional passage of the National Labor Day holiday with President Cleveland signing that into law June 28, 1894, designating the first Monday of September as Labor Day. So that's your history lesson. But you guys stick around for the sermon. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone here today and on the internet for your labor. We have such a diversity of workers just in this congregation right now. And I, I cannot identify, and I'm not going to try to identify all the various workers and their uh, respective uh, working environments. We have blue collar, we have white collar, and uh, like I told first service, there's a, there's a new one that we call new collar, and that's the, that's the technological field that's really, you know, blossomed in the last really 20 years. So they're called new collar. 
We have workers in the service industry, medical community, bankers, teachers, administrators, managers, those in construction, drivers, government workers at the county, city, county, state, federal level. We have, being in north central Kansas, obviously we have the ag sector, which many of you are indeed a part of. We have moms laboring every day at home in love, rearing children, and dads helping with that too. And I'm, I'm going to stop there because I just, it's just, there's such a plethora of, of laborers. But um, one particular group of laborers I want to I shout out today is that for our retired folks. Um, We have many retired individuals in this church that are simply busier now than they were when they retired. And I joke with my dad a lot in the last 20, 30 years, and he's even said that to me. You know, Brad, be careful with, with retirement. You might not want to retire. I was, why is that, Dad? He was like, I'm busier than I ever was back in uh, with my retail business there in Phillipsburg. But in all seriousness, we need retired folks, wise people who know a few things about laboring for the Lord. Now, I, I have a little note here. It's the idea of not just retiring from something, but to something using our God-given abilities. So we are very blessed in this church with a large contingent of retired folks who aren't retired. And I thank all of you for your service and your continued service. I so appreciate my, my parents, Bill and Libby Mason. They're in their mid-80s now still doing a lot of work with their church out in Colorado. Their, their labor of love and their servant hearts was uh, very apparent when I was growing up, and, and uh, they modeled that very well. They were both very busy. My dad was a, a business owner. My mom was a high school business teacher for 15 years. And she left the teaching profession and became a, a, a homemaker and then helped with, uh, as an accountant, helped uh, my dad with his business. They labored for Christ in their church. My dad was a deacon. My dad was an elder. My dad was a Sunday school superintendent. And my dad drove a bus every Sunday. And during the summer uh, for VBS, uh, we had a, a, a tremendous bus ministry uh, in our church. And uh, so he did that working almost every week that I can remember, six days a week. But he also knew, kind of tag on what Pastor Cliff said last week, my dad also knew the importance of a day of rest. You know, God gave us the Sabbath for a reason. He didn't need any rest. That was specifically for us. And uh, my dad tried to set a day aside for his family, for himself, and for God. My mother was a wonderful gospel singer, taught Sunday school, helped year after year with kids' ministries, teaching, cooking, baking. She still does, but she makes some of the best cream pies. Pastor would be smiling right now if he was here. Uh, but marvelous cook. She managed countless kids in the various children's ministries that she was a part of. And... Uh, I mentioned earlier, with her eldest, she, she managed me with an occasional ear pull, right? Mm. I didn't think at the time I needed it, but apparently I did. I also look back, and I'm reminded of Mrs. Gaines. She, uh, when she was retired, she was working VBS summer after summer, sharing the gospel to me and countless others with the wordless book. Showed me the need for salvation 
when I was seven years of age in July of 1972. And then there was Mrs. Roselle. Mrs. Roselle, every Wednesday night, we had Wednesday night prayer service. Every Wednesday night, she had a classroom of about 15 of us kids. I don't know how she did it, but she was diligent. She was a lady, a woman of faith who was retired and told us all about the stories of the Old and New Testament every Wednesday night. And the reason I bring this up this morning is most people, due to people like I just mentioned, my folks, two other ladies, there's four. I came to know the Lord as my personal Lord and Savior. And most Christians, at least in the United States, I've seen hands being raised, I've, I've seen the surveys, but most Christians come to know the Lord before their 18th birthday. And it's because of people I just mentioned. And on a side note, a shout out to those that helped with VBS this last summer. I think we had close to 90, 100, uh, almost every night, the last two nights. We have, I walked by uh, Fusion Wednesday night. We had a meeting. I walked by, and there was, there was quite a few in the gym. And uh, what a success we've started right now with Fusion. Thank you, Pastor Josh. But also a reminder, we have a sign-up list in the back in the, in the welcoming, welcoming uh, center. We have a sign-up list. There's still, I, I just counted, three, four uh, openings for Clash that starts in October. And what a tremendous ministry for kindergartners through sixth grade Clash. I helped last uh, spring, and I was, I was blessed. It's, it's, it's neat. Knowing that this might be the first time these kids hear Jesus, the story of Jesus. But into the message here, when I was younger, for, for, for a long time, for a long time, I looked at labor, or that four-letter word, W-O-R-K, as a consequence of sin. And I was very wrong on that. That is definitely a, a huge misconception that work is a punishment from the fall of grace in the garden. Adam had a task we read about. He labored in the garden in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. God instituted the very nature of labor at the get-go. I'm sure Adam's labor gave him an opportunity to serve his creator. He knew that. It helped, him give, uh, it helped give him a sense of, uh, of identity, a sense of fulfillment, and a satisfaction that you get on the backside of a job well done. And he needed help. That's where Eve comes in as a helpmate for Adam. And the two of them had a tremendous and a blessed relationship working the garden. But due to sin, a pure, unadulterated servitude of labor became marred, was cheapened, and thus labor became a curse. Labor became tarnished. And labor for men and women became painful. It became difficult, and it became Part of this notion of blood, sweat, and tears after the fall. And we see that, I'm not going to read the, the chapter for you, but you look at Genesis 3, the first, 10, first 15 verses, you can see the dichotomy of labor before the fall and the after. I was reading an article it's neat. <laughs> it's neat how God works because uh, I told, I didn't say this first service. Cliff knows him. This is kind of for Cliff, but uh, when, I, when I said I'd do a sermon, um, uh, I was, well, first, 
like maybe a couple of days I was contemplating what, what I should talk on, and I said, well, uh, yeah, Labor Day, Labor Day, day before Labor Day. Yeah, labor. I'll t- I'm going to talk about work. And that uh, kind of that epiphany, that, that message from God came to me while I was taking a shower. And, uh, and uh, it's just the way God works. And I was listening to AFR radio. And I already kind of put most of my sermon together about three weeks ago. Um, going to a dental appointment. I'm listening to AFR. And it's like, oh. It was like just stuff I was going to talk about. And then two weeks ago, I get the uh, I get the mail, and I'd already already put most of this together uh, several weeks ago last month. Add kind of add to it, take away from it, make sure it's under thirty minutes. And um, this comes in. I'm already done for the most part. This comes in the stand, and I would highly recommend it. We get it, I believe, once a month, maybe biannual. I can't remember. And. Uh, <laughs> I look at it, it has this farmer looking up towards heaven, the gift of labor. I'm like, that's it. I already had the, I already had the name of my sermon. And I see that, I'm like, you know, God confirms things. Like, you know, you know when you're on the right path. And I'm sure all of you have stories like this. But anyway, there's a quote that stood out for me by David Bonson. I've never heard of David Bonson. Uh, it's B A H N S E N. He's the founder of the Bonson Group Financial Management Company. Well, anyway, he states, "Quote: We were the unique part of creation that was tasked with co-creating with God, taking the raw materials of the world and going about being fruitful, multiplying, filling the earth, cultivating the earth, and caring for the garden." There was a spirit of creativity and productivity that God himself shared with us. That's cool, and I've never really thought of, of work, you know, quite like that. And that, that still holds too, true today. It's, you know, it's, it's no different. The blessing God gives us through toil. So what does this, what does this mean? What does this mean today? Where, where am I going with this? Well, because of Adam and Eve's fall, all of it, obviously all of us need salvation. That's, that's a given. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Also in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, we read that salvation is not of what we can do, not based on our work. It's a gift that only comes through Christ. Quote, for by grace we are saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that none can boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And it's, it's amazing to me as you read through the scriptures in the New Testament how embedded in scripture work is. Labor, God's work, God's labor uh, for us, intended for us on this planet. So let's look at Beloit First Christian Church. Let's look at the church in the state. Let's look at the, the church universal in this country, in this world. And we read in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 58. It says, let nothing move you, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is not in vain. In John 6, 27, we are to work for the food that endures, that never spoils, that of eternal life. So our task in this church, the, the task of the church on this planet is to labor for God. Very simple. The Christian life is one of labor, worldly labor, okay, but more importantly, godly labor. But how do we do that? What, is that? what does that look like? And like I mentioned earlier this morning, I didn't sign up. I didn't sign up for full-time ministry. I didn't go to college and seminary to be a, a pastor. 
I didn't, I, I, you know, I didn't, I'm not signed up to be a missionary. I've never been called by the Lord to go overseas, be a missionary in, in, the, in the depths of Africa. I, don't, I have never had that calling. Some people have. So what does that matter? I've not, I'm not signed up for this. But we are. We are. We labor in our thoughts. We labor in our deeds, our prayers. Our very testimony is labor. It should be 24-7. We should be missionaries wherever God has placed you. Whether it's on the farm, whether it's at Beloit Junior Senior High School, whether it's downtown in a bank, God has placed you there and you need to let your light shine. Matthew 5.16, one of my favorite verses. Let your light so shine before others that they may, see, they may see your good works, your good deeds, and glorify your Father in heaven. So our testimony should be the glorification of our Heavenly Father. So this gets me directly to the essence of our purpose in life. All right, our purpose in life, our purpose-driven life here on earth. In other words, the meaning of life. And many don't understand this. Many have no clue, none whatsoever. If you would go ask them, what is the meaning of life? I've asked this fundamental question year after year, in my class, we get into some of the philosophers and the enlightenment, and they wrestled with some of the, the greatest questions, the greatest questions in humanity. One of them is, you know, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> I, get some crazy, I get some crazy answers. Here's, here's a few that I shared earlier. To live and let live. That's the meaning of life, to live and let live. I'll lie, this, this is the most popular, you want to know the most popular, this, this is it. The meaning of, of life, to have fun and make, and make lots of money. Have fun, make lots of money. And that's the meaning of life. Another favorite is, uh, and these are the ones that you know what they're trying to do, they're trying to get an A in the class, they're kind of butter, they're trying to butter things up. Whatever you think, Mr. Mason. That's, that's, the, that's the meaning of life, whatever you think it is. All right. To do more good than bad. And, and I, as I said earlier, that, that gets really, really dangerous because now we're talking about works-based salvation. As long as we do more good than bad, then if there's something out there in the cosmos Beyond us in this earth, I, I, I'll be okay. As long as I do more good than bad. And even though that's very dangerous, and, and actually kind of sad for me, to, if you really think about it, sometimes I get responses like, no one, <clears throat> excuse me, no one can know, no one can know the purpose of life, the, the truth if there's even true, but no one, sometimes kids would say that no one knows. It's whatever you make it. All right. Not for a Christian. And oftentimes I can tell the kids who were, have been brought up in a Christian family, in a Bible-believing church, they talk about it. We talk about it. Other churches should talk about it to 5, 6, 7, 8, 11, 12, 16, 18-year-olds why were you born, when you were born, where you were born? What's this all about? So for a Christian, it is to be a servant of God who gave us life and salvation, which we didn't deserve. We didn't deserve life. He didn't have to make us. He did not have to create men and women. And he surely did not have to send his son to labor for 32, 33 years and die on the cross. He didn't have to do that. We didn't deserve it. 
And it's something, like I said earlier, we, we can't earn. Jesus, God sent Jesus to earn that grace that he gave us on the cross. So we are to glorify God and fulfill the great commission as found in Matthew 26, 19 through 20. And I've, we have heard this time and time again, it seems like, the last three, four months. A lot of Pastor Cliff's sermons, I mean, he's, he's mentioned this. And, uh, you know, I remember we had a teacher up at the school. She always talked about, I, thought, I, thought, I think it was seven hits. It takes seven hits to the brain. Seven hits to the brain to remember something. Well, I, think, I think we've heard this in the last year, at least seven hits. And that's good. 26 verses 19 through 20 in Matthew. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So these are marching orders. These, these are directives. These, these are commands. These, these, are not, these are not suggestions, people. It's not, it's not, hey, can you spare the time? Hey, if you have enough time, if you could fit it in your busy, hectic schedules, if you're in the mood, if you're in the mood. No, this is our marching orders. It's our church's marching orders. And, and, I, and I don't know who ordered the, uh, the banners. I've always loved them. I mean, we put the marching orders on our backdrop. So we as a congregation know those marching orders. When visitors, visitors come here, they know our marching orders. When unsaved come in here, they look at that. And it puts, hopefully, a, a seed, a question in their mind. What's this business all about? And if, if I remember my English from elementary school, and I don't re remember a lot of English classes in elementary school, but action verbs, look at the action verbs. Go, make, baptize, teach, obey. Action verbs. So then I asked myself this morning, how am I doing in all of this? I'm not asking how you guys are doing in all of this. I'm asking, how am I doing in all this? Because frankly, I, last year, a little bit. This year, I made the sermon for me. Honestly, for me. Not for you. But knowing God's power and how God works, I was hoping that we all can get something out of this sermon, something special with the Holy Spirit's prompting. But you know, we're all busy. I'm busy with my job now. School's kind of in session. Cross country's in session. Uh, new classes. I got a pretty big load of teen teenagers. Um, you know, a couple of dogs and a cat at home. My wonderful wife and her honey-do list this magically keeps getting longer and longer. But really, I should glorify God in all things. I should let my light shine around all those around me and love God with all my heart and love my neighbors as myself. And I should do this with a positive spirit. And my wife was, sit, was sitting in the back row with Brendan and his girlfriend, and I kind of made contact with Renee, and, and I told the rest of the congregation, I said, whatever you do, don't talk to my wife after church and ask her how I'm doing. Um, I'm not doing a good job. You got to, when you're, when you're coaching nowadays, <laughs> the... They can test your patience, junior hires. I mean, I don't. I I, I remember Daryl Kelly, uh, just retired friend of mine, after I don't 35, 36 years, most of which of, of which was with junior hires. You walk in his classroom, 25, 26 kids every hour, every day. I'm like, dude, how do you do it? How do you do that? He didn't ever respond, but in the back of my mind, hopefully with a positive spirit. Um. But Philippians 
2, verses 14 does say, do everything without complaining or arguing. And I have failed miserably at this. We have a Father in heaven that if we lean hard on him, we can find the strength to carry on our labor of love in all things. Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things, not some things, all things. In this life, especially early on, we often labor to accumulate wealth. We labor for status. We labor for power, a sense of self. This is all fleeting. If that's our objective, we're just like the song, Dust in the Wind by Kansas. I'm really dating myself. That was like 1934 or something. Hey, when that was popular, I was, I was this big. I was this big. But it's actually kind of a morbid and kind of almost a depressing song. But, you know, it is. It's, it's depressing for people that chase all those things of influence, power, money, because those things are not eternal. They're, they're, they're bye-bye. When you, when you die, they are gone. They are gone. And it's hard that when you're in your 20s and 30s and the family comes along and, you know, you start making a little bit of money, it's hard not to think about those temporal, earthly things. Not that we shouldn't. Not that we shouldn't think about some of this stuff. But it shouldn't be our primary motivation. Now, this is the crux. So if you're taking notes, you put a star Use your highlight. Christ is speaking to his disciples in Matthew 9, verse 37. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That was a problem 2,000 years ago. Is it a problem in 2024? Is the harvest plentiful? Are the, are, is the corn and the wheat ready to harvest and we just don't have enough laborers? I'm not talking literally. That's, that's the problem literally. But I'm talking spiritually. I don't know God's uh, cosmic time clock. I don't, I don't know. The angels, the angels don't even know. I mean, the Bible says that. The, the angels do not know. The angels do not know when Jesus is going to return. Nor should they. And when we start putting dates and things like that, you know, um, that's dangerous. And I've listened to pastors and read things where they try to put dates on things. I remember 1988 was a huge day. 88 reasons why Jesus was going to be coming in 1988. Oh, I was pumped. I was pumped. I was a year out of college. I was sure that Jesus was coming. And it didn't happen. But I'm going to tell you something. And I'm not going to put dates. I'm not going to do that. But it seems to me the fields have never been so ripe as now. And I'm going to tell you something else. Satan has to believe. Satan has to believe we're close. He has to believe it's close, and I'll tell you why, because in the last 5, 10, 15 years, and I know, I know U.S. history. Some people talk about the mid, late 60s, early 70s. I'm talking the last decade. Satan is laboring. Satan is toiling. Satan is working. You look at his efforts across the cultural spectrum today. In the last 10, ten years, you, right is wrong, wrong is right. I have never seen so many people confused about what is truth. This truth, that truth. Truth on TikTok, truth on YouTube. I mean, you, you, where's the truth? Hey, where is the truth? It's God's holy scripture. That's the truth. I've never seen so many, many young people that are just anxious, overly anxious, as I do now. I mean, Satan is on the tack laboring against our kids. 
against our teenagers, against our adults, against everybody, because I think he's on to something. He doesn't know. He doesn't know days, but I think he knows it's close. Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians much about the second coming of Christ. The church of Thessalonians wasn't overly large, wasn't very powerful, but it was under a lot of persecution, tremendous persecution, persecution our church has not yet seen in this country, but the church is seeing in China, that the church is seeing in Iran, the church is seeing elsewhere, not yet, not yet in the United States. But I, I heard on, uh, on a program just two weeks ago, you cannot believe the people that are coming to know the Lord in Iran. You don't hear about it. There is a revival going in Iran. The government knows it. And they're scared to death that there's going to be an, uh, an overthrow of their, uh, of their regime. But there is, the fields are ripe. The fields are ripe. Africa, the Middle East, China, all right? But we are told, the Thessalonian church was told to hold the line on truth. It's also a warning to those in the present age to hold the line before the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, specifically the Antichrist. We are, called, we are called to be the light. Christ's church is made up of laborers who have an assignment to spread the truth. We have so much we can do and should do. Speaking the truth, staying engaged personally, locally, politically, Probably one of the most important elections in the history of the United States. I know people say this, they said that four years ago, and four years before that, and they'll probably say it in four years from now. I'm just, my opinion, probably one of the most important elections. And I know there's a segment of born again Christians that don't want to get political. God wants us to get political. I'm not up here. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. You have to vote your conscience. You have to vote for truth. You have to vote for love. You have to vote for life. And you, you call out to the Holy Spirit, who should I vote for? At the, at the local, at the county, at the state, and the federal level. But we have to be engaged with the culture of today. People, the, the darker the world gets, the brighter the truth gets. We need to hold God's light, his word up high, like the sun, like the song uh, Max uh, three, four weeks ago. Your favorite song growing up, my, my favorite song. You, you remember that, but okay. You know, you, <laughs> was, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You even tried singing it too. Don't, don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. And uh, probably one of, the, one of the most important. Jesus loves me and this little light. Can you think of two songs better than those two? They have more meaning than those two songs. But we must be engaged with joy and hope. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Always be, and I mentioned this, we were talking about, remember last year I was talking about labor. It was Noah's labor and the big ark and all that. But I used this verse in, in that sermon, and I love this verse, 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. I sometimes forget the gentleness and respect. You know, when you think you know the truth, and I know the truth, God's word is the truth, and you want to be bold about it, but remember we have to do that with gentleness and a little respect. But the church shouldn't change its mission in 2024. It's the same mission the church had 2,000 years ago. That's the mission. That, remember the directive, the command. That's the mission. It has not changed. God planted his church in these times. We were born in these times. We have a job to do. In 2 Thessalonians, we see a church in Paul's times that pl was planted in fertile soil. The church today is planted in fertile soil. When the church of God is stronger, we can make a bigger impact. 
We have an opportunity to build up, the, uh, to build up God's church to engage in the culture, in the society that we are in the midst of. Now, our culture, although I agree, often rejects the truth. Our culture often rejects God's truth. We don't give up. We don't. We can't. We still must speak the truth to ears that are willing to hear. And then it's, then it's on God. Then it's on the Holy Spirit. You plant the seed, and I know some of us get really, really uh, angry maybe at God. That, hey, I've talked to this person about you, about you and your son. I've, I've asked this person to, to church three or four or five times. Allow God to work in his timing. We're not, we're not that far from Europe, from Western Europe, from specifically uh, England, not to dump on, on the Europeans. But they have really distanced themselves from God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You go to London, you go to England, you find more churches boarded up that are open for business. Likewise in Belgium, France, you're lucky. Uh, most of those countries, I've read, I've read the numbers. Most of those countries on a Sunday morning, you might get 10% of the population that even attends church. I think our light has faded in this country. And if you don't believe that, well, that's fine. But I, in the last you know, 50 years, 60, 75 years, our, our light has faded. But I'm going to be optimistic. Even though our light has faded, it's still lit. God's church is lit. We need to lift it up through God's help, through his encouragement, through his strength. I, uh, just two weeks ago, I was um, reading the sermon, City on a Hill. And I would highly recommend just YouTube, or don't YouTube, query Yahoo, Google, whatever you use. Just type in City on the Hill. And then I would also put maybe John Winthrop with that. You know, just make sure you're getting what you need to get. In 1630, he wrote City on a Hill. And it talked about, it laid out beautifully, one of the best sermons ever made by a man. And he laid out beautifully the responsibility of the church and the United States of America, the future United States of America, mind you, and how we were a city on the hill. We are a city on the hill, and our light should shine for the rest of the planet because of this Judeo-Christian foundation that was laid that soon became the United States of America. It, it, people, it is a sermon of conviction. I think... If I was president of the United States, executive order, I would make that sermon read once a week in Congress, at the Senate and the Supreme Court. John Winthrop. Read it. It's, it's, it's good. It is good stuff. He was a man of conviction, and he spoke and he wrote the truth. All right? So finally, this morning, I'm reminded of a particular scene in the Bible. It was one of my favorite scenes. Last, last year, I, I started with a boat. I'm going to end with a boat. I must like boats. I like, I like water. Unless I fall in the water. I don't have a life jacket. And I hate the water. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with a boat. You probably know which one this is in the New Testament. Jesus sent his disciples out. He stayed back and I, I think uh, dispersed the crowds, whatnot. Disciples are in a boat. And, uh, and these guys, most of these guys, not all, most of these guys are fishermen. They knew, they knew all about boats and boat safety. And it says that they were out there and things got really rough. The winds came up, you know, three, four foot, you know, waves pounding them, you know. And, and um, all of a sudden, they see what they thought initially was a ghost. The Bible says they were terrified, scared. Scared to death, 
And then Peter kind of recognized, well, maybe that was Jesus. And he called out, you know, Lord, call me. And, and he obeyed. He obeyed. And he, <laughs> right out of the boat. I, I, would, oh, no, I would have loved to have been there. And he started walking on water. And I always thought as a kid, how many steps do you think he made? Two, three steps, four steps, 10 yards, 15 yards? I don't know. It doesn't say. It's not important. But he obeyed and he started walking towards Jesus. And uh, it was working good for him. For a little bit. And, uh, you know, the only, the only human being probably that I, I know of that uh, has walked on water. I mean, Jesus, fully human, fully God. But Peter, the only, only human being that ever walked on water. And uh, he was doing a pretty good job, miraculously, through Jesus. And then uh, what happens? What happens? He takes his eye off the mark. He took his eyes off the mark, lost focus, and he began to sink. He's crying out. Lord, Lord, help me, help me, help me. He's putting his hand up. You wonder how far down he went. It was he all the way up to the chin? But he puts his hand out. And Jesus is there for him. The water is the world in which we live today. That's the water. Our culture is the water. As long as we fix our eyes on Jesus, we can stay above the waves of the world as we labor for our Lord. Lord, The moment we begin focusing on the winds around us and the waves below us, we are going to sink. So now more than ever, like Peter, we must not lose sight on he who's most important He who gives us strength and encouragement, the author of salvation. My challenge today for myself, and really for all of us, we need to step out of our comfort zones, take a step forward in faith, and help fulfill the Great Commission. Paul wrote further in chapter 3 of Thessalonians. He warned the church not to be idle, not to be undisciplined, for the church not to get too comfortable. Get into the game if you find yourself on the sidelines. Labor for good, pray for doors of opportunity to open and seeds to be planted. Speak the truth of God's love and the redemption story to all of those who have ears willing to listen to you. And there may be those here today who are not ready to labor for for God and his kingdom because you're not part of God's kingdom yet. You have not trusted Jesus and accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You need to become a player to play in the game. The Sunday before Labor Day would be a perfect time to accept Christ's labor while he was on this earth and his ultimate labor of love when he died on the cross for our sins. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love and how that was demonstrated on the cross by your son, Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity to labor for you as servants to further your kingdom. I ask for strength for myself and those present to fulfill the great commission you commanded. May we be bold in our work, our testimony. May we stay focused in these days in which we live. And for those who may not have ever called upon your son Jesus and accepted the work on the cross that he demonstrated, may they do so today. We thank you for your many blessings, and we thank you for the hope that we have in you. I pray this in your name. Amen. If if you'd like to visit 
with uh, myself or any deacon, any elder, any member of this church about the laboring, about laboring for God. Uh, we would be delighted to talk to you about it. But right now, let's go ahead and close and listen to this wonderful song that will be presented this morning. Thank you.